Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan. Science fiction is the most important genre in movies and literature simply because as an art form it not only inspires us but in some ways guides our future development. Science fiction writers use their imaginations to make the next major leaps in technology on paper so that the next generation can dream about it and hopefully actually achieve it in real life. Unfortunately, it seems like almost every depiction of the future in science fiction is negative, however. Perhaps that says something about humanity's view of itself more than the actual trajectory our you know, species will take, I hope. In any case, today I thought it'd be kind of interesting to look at some of the more crazy apocalyptic future visions that humanity has created and pair those with some of the most impressive engineering marvels that we have created as a solution to those apocalypses. In an alternative timeline in 2014, climate engineering in order to stop global warming goes terribly wrong. We basically spray this coolant in our atmosphere and it triggers a massive ice age which freezes over the entire world. 17 years after the event, the only known remaining humans on the planet are passengers on a circumnavigational train that continuously journeys around the world. The train is an engineering marvel and has a massive plow in front of it that breaks through any ice or snow that might pile up on the tracks. As long as the train doesn't stop, then the people on board will be safe from disaster and the freezing cold. Bong Joon-ho is the director of the film. He's probably one of the best in the world. Unfortunately for us Americans, most of his movies are dedicated towards the Korean market, so we don't have as much exposure to him. His most recent film, Parasite, won Best Pictures at the Academy Awards, the first non-English film to do so. Now, most of Bong Joon-ho's films have heavy social commentary about class issues intertwined with the central narrative. And in Snowpiercer, things are no different. Just like on a real train, there are classes on the Snowpiercer train. At the end of the train, in the last compartment, are individuals who illegally boarded the train without a ticket. These stairways were desperate for survival as the world collapsed around them and were treated like vermin and barely given the basics for survival. The passengers in the front of the train employ a large security force to keep those at the back oppressed and in their place and away from their luxuries like the one sushi cart left on earth or some basic education slash propaganda and of course the all important nightlife. Snowpiercer and its many compartments and different classes neatly represents a very cliche look at our own world's inequalities and its plotline follows the revolution and struggle carried out by those at the bottom of society and at the end of the train who try to reach the front. They're basically stabbing you in the eyes with metaphors the entire movie. At the head of the train is the engineer and owner of the train, Joseph Wilford. He alone predicted that humanity's attempt to save the Earth from global warming would doom it. He was the one who transformed his luxury liner train into a doomsday survival machine. Wilford is alone up front and must maintain vigilant watch over the nuclear engine that powers the whole of humanity. Because Wilford has basically saved humans from extinction, he is worshipped almost like a god by the train's passengers. But he's also created hell on the tracks for a good portion of these people in order to create a stability. Towards the end of the film, the revolutionaries led by Captain America reach Wilford, and Captain America has a choice to either perpetuate this cycle of inequality and maintain stability by taking over Wilford's position, or brave the cold wilderness outside and find a new way to live. Whether I agree with Bong Joon-ho's politics or not, I can't help but admire his mastery in weaving social commentary so seamlessly into his narrative. Everything is so organic. Unlike James Cameron's own disaster, Avatar, Death of the Navi. In the world of mortal engines, an event known as the 60 Minute War basically destroys the surface of the Earth, or at least makes it very hard to live on the surface of the Earth. This is all due to a massive exchange of WMDs by the world's major powers. Thanks, Finland. Anyway, what's left of humanity regroups and creates a new type of living on mobile cities known as traction cities. Most of these cities follow the philosophy of municipal Darwinism, which essentially isn't a philosophy, it's just rule of the jungle. Larger mobile cities will hunt down and destroy smaller settlements, absorbing all of their raw materials and people. Now, these mobile cities are impressive steampunk creations the size of small city centers. Amongst the largest traction cities, of course, is the city of London. It pretty much preys on everything around it. 
Now, Mortal Engines actually takes place hundreds, maybe thousands of years after the end of the 60-minute war. So much of humanity's technology is lost in the process. Old 21st century relics like computer and smartphones are treasured by historians, but humanity has long lost the ability to fix and repair these complicated devices. Still, the traction cities are engineering marvels in their own right, especially the large multi-tiered cities like London. The sheer amount of power and steel required to make something as large as a city center move is incomprehensible. That is, unless you take a look at our next film, which kind of scales up things. In the year 2061, the sun prematurely turns into a red giant somehow and threatens to engulf the Earth's orbit within just a century. Which is highly unrealistic, but let's continue anyway. This existential crisis forces all the nations worldwide to drop their own interests and form a coalition known as the United Earth Government. Humanity comes up with a plan known as the Wandering Earth Project. The idea is to migrate Earth out of the solar system to Alpha Centauri, the closest star system. I mean, the whole idea seems a bit overkill. Why not just move the Earth a little further away from the Sun so it isn't engulfed? Also, Alpha Centauri is a binary star system. Have you guys seen what Tatooine looks like? It's terrible. Anyway, what is really cool about this film is how humanity is able to mobilize their Earth. This is a process that takes all of humanity's ingenuity, resources, and manpower to complete. First, the rotation of the Earth must be stopped, which of course causes huge disasters like tsunamis and forces most of humanity to take shelter in vast underground cities beneath the surface. In order to stop the Earth's rotation and also propel the Earth, 12,000 fusion-powered engines are built across the Northern Hemisphere along with torque engines at the equator. Now, these engines aren't perfect, and Earth is not exactly a spaceship, it's a planet. So when Earth crosses into Jupiter's orbit for a gravity assist, massive seismic shockwaves on the surface of the planet disable several of Earth's engines. Without these engines, Earth's trip to Alpha Centauri will end up in pieces in Jupiter's orbit. Now, this film isn't really that practical or realistic, but it does push scale and epicness to the next level. I mean, just look at how beautiful Jupiter would look if it were in Earth's night sky. Next up on our list is the Moscow Metro. Communist countries generally aren't great at creating economic opportunities for the average man or woman, but that's because they take everyone's money and put it into large and very visible massive state projects. The Moscow Metro was supposed to be a passion project for Stalin. He supposedly called it the Palace of the People. In reality, it was a great way to distract the Muscovites from the empty grocery shelves and crushing poverty. The Moscow Metro also doubled as an underground bunker system in case the Cold War ever turned into a hot war. American history books oftentimes overplay just how dangerous the Soviet Union was. I mean, the Americans outnumbered the Soviets in military assets and definitely outnumbered them in how many ICBMs we had. And so trust me, Moscow feared us far more than we actually fear them, which is also why the Moscow Metro could easily store a million people inside of it in the event of a nuclear attack. And many of its subway stations are actually buried as deep as a mile underground. Even the most powerful nuclear weapon will not be able to penetrate that deep into the Earth. On top of that, it's said that Moscow even has a secret subway line and shelter that are designed for the top leaders of the Soviet Union. It even had a command center and communication hub so that Stalin could keep in touch with forces still operational on the surface. In the Metro 2033 novels and subsequent video games, only about 200,000 Muscovites make it underground when the air sirens start going off. In the months and years following the attack, tens of thousands of people perish. At first because of a lack of resources and fighting for those resources, and eventually because of the radioactive mutants that make it down into the tunnel system. What makes Metro 2033's engineering marvel, the Moscow subway, so interesting is the fact that most of it is real, or at least an exaggeration of the truth. All the stations at Artem, the main protagonist walkthrough, actually do exist. Should you be in Moscow on vacation, you could actually visit everything. Even the blast doors that keep these places safe exist as well. And in classic Russian style, the story of Metro 2033 is completely nihilist. Nothing really matters when society breaks down, and those who cling on morality and religion are the first ones to go. It's completely horrifying. Which is why I highly recommend you guys check it out. When a crack emerges deeply beneath the planet's oceans, giant kaiju monsters begin emerging attacking Earth's cities. These monsters are impossible to stop with conventional weapons, and so humanity actually creates two very impressive engineering marvels. 
First, we have the famous Jaeger. These are gigantic robots that are the size of skyscrapers, but have fully articulating limbs and hands, along with a wide variety of weapons and tools at their disposal. Because, obviously, the only weakness that kaijus have is Brazilian jiu-jitsu scaled up to their size. These gigantic robots are so powerful and hard to control that it takes the combined power of two human brains to pilot it. The last thing I guess you want in a gigantic monster fight is latency. But what makes the Jaegers in Pacific Rim so impressive is that these are mostly metal constructs, yet somehow after repeated blows, the metal in these structures never get brittle and somehow can absorb all of that movement and pressure. We're probably dealing with fabrication techniques and materials that we just don't have access to here on Earth yet. We actually did a full video on how difficult it would be for us to make a Jaeger, in case you're wondering. The problem with the Jaegers is that they're extremely, extremely expensive to build and very expensive to maintain as well. And to make matters worse, the quantity of kaijus and the size of the kaijus only continue to increase, and the Jaegers can hardly keep up with the demand. The death of one Jaeger represents a huge blow to humanity's war effort against these monsters, and so eventually, a massive anti-kaiju wall begins construction. It's a classic human mistake. Fear leads to stupidity, and stupidity leads to a static defense. Now, in Pacific Rim, the wall construction begins in 2020. Unfortunately, in our own timeline, we've had way too many disasters go on in 2020, so I think the kaiju emergence is being pushed back for a little bit. Eventually, the United Nations cut financing on the Jaegers and focus only on this massive defensive structure. This wall rings in the entire Pacific Ocean, stretching along the coasts of North and Central America and East and South Asia. Unfortunately, the first time a Class 4 Kaiju reaches the wall, it quickly runs right through it and destroys Sydney. It's an impressive failure. So there you have it, guys. Those are five or six amazing engineering marvels that humanity has created in the face of their own destruction. Hopefully, this is more inspirational rather than truth, because I really don't want to see an apocalypse happen in my lifetime. Let's be inspired instead by the great things like humanity coming together and, and letting go of their little squabbles to face a larger threat. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below. And as usual, thanks for joining us today. My name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie and you are the protagonist.